ranking the claims from prominent vaccine skeptic RFK Jr., who did an interview with Joe Rogan. I am a scientist with a PhD in immunology and pharmaceutical sciences, and today we're going to watch clips from that interview and rate Kennedy's claims on a standard misinformation tier list. This video is not sponsored, and I'm not selling any supplements, courses, or programs. Now, to be fair, RFK Jr. is a lawyer by training, not a scientist, and he doesn't claim to be comfortable reading science. I'm used to reading science. I'm very comfortable reading it. I wanted to be a scientist when I was a little kid. Oh, I guess what I meant is it's not like he claims to have anywhere near a PhD level of knowledge on topics like mercury or vaccines. I know a lot about mercury. I've been suing people. When you sue somebody, you get a PhD in that. You know more than anybody in the world. You have to or you're not going to win your lawsuit. Very well. To kick us off and set the tone, rank one in the world is going straight to the A tier of misinformation due to the sheer confidence which I suspect will carry the day in the absence of true expertise. Before we talk about mercury though, let's see what caused the 1918 Spanish flu. Uh, the Spanish flu was vaccine-induced flu. Originally, they said it was a flu, but when they've gone back and actually they have all the, sam the samples from thousands of people, they died from bacteriological uh, pneumonia. Mm, the Spanish flu was in 1918. The flu vaccine was developed in the 1930s and the 1940s, which makes it very unclear to me how the vaccine that did not exist could have caused the pandemic. He went on to say that the flu virus wasn't actually part of the issue at all. It was the secondary bacterial infections that were killing people after they were weakened by the flu. That can certainly happen after a bad viral illness, and that did happen in the 1918 Spanish flu. Of course, the key thing there is that those secondary bacterial infections don't happen without the damage of the primary viral infection that messes up the integrity and the defenses of your respiratory epithelium. So I remain convinced that the flu was indeed an important part of the flu pandemic of 1918. In a flash of self-awareness, he did then say, yeah, I shouldn't talk about this, Joe. Okay, so this is, let's I don't remember enough about let's, it. So I rate flu pandemic deaths were not caused by the flu at B tier. If not for that falter in confidence at the end, this one could have been A tier. Let's now move on to discussion of mercury and vaccines, his specialty. People knew then that mercury was horrendously neurotoxic. Pause here for one second. I feel that now's a good time to point out that there is zero mercury in the childhood vaccines in the United States, and that's been true for decades at this point. The only place you'll find mercury in vaccines is in multi-dose vials of influenza vaccines, where ethyl mercury is used as a preservative. There are also single-dose flu vaccines that have zero mercury because they don't need a preservative in single-dose vials. The good news is that subsequent research in dozens of studies from all over the world have since shown that ethyl mercury exposure from vaccines did not cause any developmental problems anyway. But the bottom line is that childhood vaccines have no mercury. Mercury is a thousand times more neurotoxic than lead. Well, you would never shoot lead into your baby. That 1,000 times more neurotoxic claim is a made-up number intended to scare you in the context of discussion of vaccinating children, which doesn't make much sense because as we just discussed, there is no mercury in the childhood vaccines, but he fails to mention that until like 30 minutes later. For me, mercury is 1,000 X lead gets a C rating. It's just too round and large of a number to be believable. Switch that up to something like 15 fold and reference some legitimate sounding research journal, and this probably could have made it into the B tier. Everybody was saying, well, how can you put mercury into a child. Who would do that? And they said, well, it's a different kind of mercury. It's ethyl mercury, and the ethyl mercury is excreted very quickly. This is actually true. There are two types of mercury here. Methyl mercury is the type found in predator fish like tuna or shark that is concerning at higher dosages. That's often confused with ethyl mercury, the type used as a preservative in multi-dose flu vaccines. Ethyl mercury is excreted much faster from the body and is therefore less concerning. Ah, but now we tell a tale of a critical study about mercury in children. In 2003, a CDC scientist called Picciero did a study where he gave tuna sandwiches that were mercury, you know, contaminated to children and then measured their blood and the mercury from the tuna sandwich was there a half-life 64 days later. So it was still there 64 days. So I read the 2002 study from Picciero and I was very disappointed to learn that no one was given tuna sandwiches or tuna fish or even methyl mercury at all. This was a chat GPT level of hallucination. The hallucination tuna sandwich for me is solid S-tier material, harmless detail, very convincing to listeners, and even to me, until I actually read the paper, and the cherry on top is that it tips you off to the fact that he hasn't read the paper in a while, or possibly ever, based on what he said next about their findings. And he injected the children with mercury from a vaccine, and that mercury disappeared from their blood within a week. Well, actually, that part was true. In the study, they did give the children vaccines with ethyl mercury, and found that it was excreted from their blood very quickly, which is what you want to have happen. But now let's assess one of the study's most important discoveries. But well, what happened to the mercury? 
because Pichiero couldn't find it in the children's urine or in their feces or in their hair or sweat or nails. So where is it? Gosh, where did that mercury go? It's a mystery. Now I know he just said they couldn't find it in their feces, but it was in fact found in their feces at high levels. From the research study directly, ethyl mercury seems to be eliminated from blood rapidly via the stools after parenteral administration of thimerosal in vaccines. Parenteral administration there means it was given as an injection, like a regular vaccine, and thimerosal is that preservative with ethyl mercury. You don't even have to read the full study. It's right there in the abstract. We seem to be drumming up a sensational story where the facts don't matter and references to research articles serve as nothing more than appeals to authority, sounding very convincing until you spend 60 seconds looking at the papers and realizing they show the exact opposite of what Kennedy was claiming. This one is going A tier since it was right there in the abstract and Joe Rogan's live fact checker apparently couldn't catch that, despite this being his one job on the largest podcast in the world. Somebody handed me a transcript of a secret meeting that took place in 1999. Straight to S tier. This is elite. Now typically, if any part of your argument rests on alleged transcripts of secret meetings, my eyes glaze over instantly like someone cast a spell at me. However, so as not to let you down, I went. I looked up that meeting. I looked up those transcripts. Turns out it was not actually a very secret meeting at all. The transcripts are freely available. The presentations and supporting documents from the conference were published for anyone to read, which I did. I spent hours reading over 200 pages of the meeting transcripts, and it was the most boring thing I've done in a very long time. A bunch of nerds sat in a room and talked about data and statistics and correlations, and not about covering up massive mercury poisoning missions. But also, and most importantly, like we said before, childhood vaccines haven't had mercury for decades at this point, so why are we still discussing this if not to stoke fear and emotion? So as not to beat a dead bear, I suggest we leave the mercury behind, and now watch a clip of Kennedy's summary of the first published COVID vaccine trial. Astonishingly, he manages to be wrong in three different ways in under 30 seconds. So what they did is they had 22,000 people got the vaccine, 22,000 had done it, and they have six months of data. Some of that is unblinded, but it's six months. And during that six-month period, in the vaccine group, one person died of COVID. And in the placebo group, two people died from COVID. So that allows... Pfizer to tell the public and, you know, FDA to tell the public, oh, this vaccine is 100% effective because two is 100% of one. That is what insane. They yeah, that would be insane if it was true, which it's not. First, the vaccine efficacy in that study was 95%, not 100%, so we're getting basic stats wrong from the start because you have to in order to make the fake math work for his fake story of two deaths versus one death. Second, the whole point of that study wasn't looking at protection against death, but rather protection against symptomatic COVID-19, which the vaccine did reduce by 95%. That was true at that time, long before the development of new variants. Third, and most funnily, even if they were comparing rates of death, that's the opposite of how you would do the calculation for vaccine efficacy. If the vaccine group had one death and the placebo group had two deaths, that would be a 50% relative reduction in death because you're cutting the two deaths in half, not reducing them by 100%. If it was 100% effective against death, that would have reduced it from the alleged two deaths to zero deaths, so he doesn't even know the equation to calculate vaccine efficacy in the first place. The highly coveted three times wrong in 30 seconds is going to the A tier. Now let's leave COVID behind and turn to rates of adverse responses to vaccines in children. Congress had told them you have to accurately count vaccine injuries and they weren't doing it. But when they did it, when they actually looked, they found that it's not one in a million, it's one in 37 kids had you know, had potential vaccine claims. Ooh, one in 37 sounds kind of high. Now the key part that he's leaving out is that in that study, what was counted as an adverse event included a lot of stuff that you and I probably would find pretty boring and probably would not call an injury. For example, if a child got a vaccine, then they had a fever the next day and they called their pediatrician to see if that was okay, or they went to their pediatrician, that would have been logged in the system and counted as an adverse effect of the vaccine, even if that fever went away the next day and the child was fine after that. And technically, that's exactly the correct term that we use in the industry, adverse event. Adverse events can be very mild, very boring in nature, it's just a technical term. However, if you call it a vaccine injury, I suspect that most people interpret that as a severe adverse event, which is simply not happening anywhere near that rate. I'm going to rate 1 in 37 get injured as B-tier misinformation. You had anyone debate you publicly? 
publicly about any of these? They, nobody will debate me. For 18 years, nobody will debate me. In fact, I've scheduled many, many debates, and I, I've asked Hotez many, many times to debate me. You know, at this point, I'm not sure I would agree to debate him either. It took me dozens of hours of research and background reading to sort through research papers and videos and transcripts in preparation for making this video, but you can't do that in real time in a debate. In a debate, all I could do would be to sit there and be like, hmm. That doesn't sound quite right. And then pull out my phone and search for five minutes and read a paper. And that's not very interesting for a live event. Conflicts of interest. In his interview, Kennedy did not discuss any of his conflicts of interest or financial ties related to vaccine hesitant groups, including his own. In the caption of this video, I provide my conflict of interest information as well as what I can discern of Kennedy's from reading online.